Now, in case you guys are wondering what I'm wearing, this is a tupenu, and that's T-U-P-E-N-U, tupenu. In Tongan and many other Polynesian cultures, it's a pretty common piece of clothing. But since I grew up here in the States, I usually save it for church and really anything family-related. And if I'm going to be honest, I started wearing it as an excuse to wear gym shorts and flip-flops to church. I mean, like, guys, look at this, okay? You have no idea how comfortable this is. But trust me, it's way better than slacks. I would know. And today, I still wear it to flex on my friends. But now I have another goal, to teach others about my culture. You see, I wasn't always comfortable wearing my tupenu in public. And don't get me wrong, I was never bullied for wearing it or anything like that. But out of an instinctual fear that I wouldn't fit in, that I would somehow be less American if I didn't wear the usual pants, I put my tupenu in the back of my closet, and I didn't touch it for months after I first got it. In a desire to assimilate to the culture around me, I severed one of the few connections that I had to my family's culture. And that is a textbook example of cultural assimilation in the United States. But as you can probably tell by the fact that I'm wearing it, I kind of got over that fear which should mean that I'm over the whole cultural crisis thing, right? <laughs> yeah, no, no. Here's the deal. While my family is Tongan, I still feel a strong connection to American culture. I mean, I was born in Washington, I went to school in Arizona, and growing up, I've been surrounded by American culture on a daily basis. Look, I was in the Boy Scouts for like six years, okay? I got red, white, and blue flowing through these veins. But because of that, whenever I'm around my family or other Polynesians, while I may look like one of them, I don't always feel like one of them. Like thousands, if not millions of other Americans, I felt torn between two cultures, the one that I grew up in and the one that I inherited. Eventually, I asked myself, if I'm not Tongan enough to be Tongan, and I'm also not American enough to be American, where do I belong? And after years of living in the messy middle between cultures, I finally realized that I was already there, right in the middle. And so today, my goal is to show you how I learned to thrive in that middle, through the stories that I and many others share, and my hope is that together we can learn to overcome this divide and the struggle it creates one that is felt not only by people here in America, but by anyone that feels connected to multiple cultures. Now, in my experience, whenever we talk about immigration, whether it's in political debates, uh, college seminars, or, heck, even Thanksgiving dinner, the conversation is almost always focused on the impacts that immigrants have on the U.S., what follows is the usual combination of random statistics, bad jokes, and interesting opinions. But no matter the occasion, the focus is almost always the same, the impact of the immigrant. We could go on for hours talking about the effects that immigrants have had, currently have, or could potentially have on the U.S. But what are the effects that culture has on the children of immigrants? Culture plays an essential part in life. It tells you what clothes to wear, what food to eat, what values you should keep, almost everything. So when the second and third generation kids grow up in a country surrounded by a culture that is different from the one in their own home, they end up living in a weird middle ground between the two. Suddenly, the generational gap that is natural between kids and their family is magnified by cultural differences that normally don't exist. And as if that wasn't enough, feeling socially excluded outside of the home becomes an all-too-familiar sensation. And I'll admit, while I was preparing and writing this talk, I was worried that this issue was as universal as I thought it was. You know, maybe it was just my experience, my awkwardness with my family. So I surveyed family, friends, and strangers alike and I was looking for their stories, their experiences as individuals that grew up connected to multiple cultures. 
in the survey, I asked them to identify times in their lives where they felt that pull between cultures, if they had ever been pushed to accept one over the other, and where they felt like they belonged, if at all. And in the end, I got 27 responses. And across the board, the results were the same. Whether past or present, we had all felt that pull between cultures. And so, I tell you this, that this is our story as much as it is my own. Growing up away from my culture, the term coconut was used by my family and friends as a joke from time to time. It means that you're brown on the outside, but you're white on the inside. And while it might have been nothing more than a punchline at times, that idea sparked the question. If I'm not Tongan enough to be Tongan, and I'm not American enough to be American, where do I belong? And at first, I would have told you that I was an American through and through. I mean, come on, I loved fireworks and freedom, and as a Boy Scout, I idolized Captain America, the ultimate Boy Scout. I mean, look, he's kind and brave, and above all, unapologetically American. And I, like many other 10-year-olds at the time, wanted to be just like him. And luckily, for younger me at least, being an American was a pretty easy thing to do. As a kid, I didn't have a lot of Tongan influence in my life. There weren't a lot of other Polynesians for me to grow up with and you know, make friends with. And I never really felt connected to my culture unless we were visiting family or making ethnic food for special occasions and family reunions. What really began to change my cultural perspective wasn't a lack of ethnic food or friends. It was a language barrier one that separated me from my family. And trust me, playing that little impromptu game of charades with your grandpa or your grandma because you have no idea what they're saying and they just really need their cane is pretty fun, I'm not going to lie. But sadly, this linguistic gap can also have much more serious implications. And I never really noticed it until I was at a family funeral. And to my surprise, the entire ceremony was written, sung, and spoken in exclusively Tongan. And at first, I did my best to play along, you know, nodding along, saying amen when you're supposed to. But after a couple hours of watching my family and my parents cry at the stories and the songs that were shared, I realized that I could only feel a superficial sadness. Yes, I could still empathize with my family, of course, but I could only do so through my own experiences with loss and grief. The stories and the songs and the meanings behind them were lost to me because I had never learned the language. In that moment, in a room surrounded by my own family, I felt like a stranger. I didn't feel like a real Tongan, but I wanted to. I had always been connected to my culture, but I had never felt at home in it. So, right around the end of middle school and the beginning of high school, I decided that I was going to make a change. I was going to own up to my Tongan heritage. So I wore my Tupenu to church. I started researching Tongan history when I could, and when people did the normal thing and assumed that I was Hawaiian after hearing that I was Polynesian, I made a point of correcting them rather than just letting it slide like I used to. And trust me, I love Hawaiians, okay? They are great people. But I'm not Hawaiian. I'm Tongan. But as I began to get closer and embrace more of my Tongan heritage, I realized that I was separated from my more American peers in ways that I had never even expected. Look, here's a good example. I remember the first time that I saw one of my friends talk back to their mom in public. Yes. I saw that, and I was like, uh -huh, they're going to die. They're dead. <laughs> That's it. But to my surprise, when their mother started discussing a solution, an agreement, rather than a punishment, I remember I looked to my sister, and I was like, we can do that. She later tried it with our mother. I see some of you can relate. And yeah, it didn't go very well. Uh, we found out very fast that we could, in fact, not do that. 
It wasn't just the food we traded at lunch, trading pasta for lupulu. At a fundamental level, we had been raised differently. And so the things that we considered to be normal growing up were also different. But once I recognized that fact, now not only was I not Tongan enough, I also wasn't American enough. And again, I was worried that this was just a me issue. But as I looked through the responses to my survey, I found an experience that mirrored mine almost exactly. She was a young Indian girl who was born and raised here in the US. But since she grew up in a predominantly Caucasian neighborhood, she felt pressured to know anything and everything about Indian culture. Her entire life, she felt the need to represent a culture that she had never really been close to. And so to bring it back to me, I had swung from one side to the other, one extreme to the next, and I had failed at both. So I came back to square one, right in the middle. But to my surprise, I realized that I was more at home there than I had ever been at either extreme. And with the gift of hindsight, I realized why that was. I was born in the middle, so it made sense that the middle would be my home. Yes, being a second or third generation immigrant creates unique problems. However, it also gives us unique opportunities. Personally, I feel like I've always been a more empathetic person because of it. And don't get me wrong, yes, I'm a social and outgoing person, which helps a lot when it comes to making first impressions. But I can follow through with those first impressions with more people than I otherwise would have because I grew up with an understanding of multiple cultures. And to clarify, this isn't just a brown issue. I know a lot of the time when we talk about immigration, especially here in the US, it's common to associate the word immigrant with brown. But to be clear, this is an issue that can be felt by any immigrant, not just the brown ones. When I was looking through the responses to my survey, I found that I had people respond from Ecuador, Costa Rica, Mexico, India, China, Vietnam, Benin, Ethiopia, Bosnia, and Serbia. In fact, that Serbian response came from a good friend of mine who told me all about her confusing experience as someone who, growing up in America as a Serbian, celebrated Christmas on January 7th and not on December 25th with the rest of us, along with the many other cultural differences that she noticed growing up with Serbian and American culture. Whether you're from Tonga, India, Serbia, it doesn't matter. We are all feeling that pool between cultures. And while it's okay to lean into one more than the other, we shouldn't discount the possibility of living in the in-between. Look, if you can lean into one over the other, go for it. More power to you. But if you're like me, and you feel a strong connection to both, and you don't want to leave one behind and leave the other, I invite you to stay in the middle. I'll be honest. I don't know what that middle looks like for everyone. What the middle looks like for someone else depends on their experiences and their story. But I do know this. We're not our parents, and we're not our neighbors, so why would you pretend to be either? We were born into the messy middle, so why can't we live in it? Thank you. <laughs>